We've just got a few questions that we're going to go through uh, today. I'll ask questions to individuals directly, um, and there'll be one or two that I'll ask the group to whomever feels like jumping in. Um, we have about 45 minutes for this session, and we'll also open up to questions from everybody here if there's anything burning that you'd like to address to our panelists. Um, so to start off with, Mr. Kim, what do you think? for Korean Red Cross, what does innovation mean to you and to your organization?가대들을 찾아내고 인도주의 환경에 주도 범밀히 대응하면서 그 효율성과 효과성을 향상시키는 그런 방법이라고 생각합니다. Thank you, Mr. Kim. That's fantastic. Um, Eric, I might pose that same question to you. Sure. What is what is innovation? Yeah, to you and to your own definition. Well, I think we can look at very textbook definitions, things like the four Ps. Um, I see it as something that's more than optimization. It's something that really can lead to a transformation in what currently exists or what, whether it's a practice or a product or a position or a paradigm. Um, so it can be seen as a process or a set of outputs. Um, for us at Field Ready, and I'll talk more about what Field Ready is and does tomorrow, uh, it's at the center of what we do. It's why we were created. We are trying to not just improve the way humanitarian aid is done, but actually transform it. Um, and so I think there's, um, along with those sort of engineering type steps that often go into uh, innovation, I think there's one critical factor that I'll think I'll add that, I, that others might um, might uh, skip, but there, I think there's an element that when innovation is done right, uh, the process of it, but also the outputs, there can very often be a sense of, of new ownership, of participation, of things like creativity and fun are essential to that. So thinking very, uh, what's often called outside the box, or thinking uh, laterally differently about a, about a uh, a problem is, is, is what really innovation is all about. And that's how we get breakthroughs, that's how we get transformation. Fantastic, thank you. So it's really about how do we look at things differently, how do we partner with non-traditional actors, how do we have a curious mindset when we're approaching issues. Um, Mr. Hyun, may I ask, how do you know if your organization is being innovative? How, how do we measure that? It's really a basic and hard question for me, <laughs> so I wrote down uh, prior to the podcast. Uh, it's a good question is, how can uh, I know my organization is innovative, right? Uh, as a tech uh, for my uh, company, is the reading, learning, education, and training institution in South Korea. Uh, it is very critical that we ascertain emerging needs and challenges arising from public education field, especially from both teachers' point of view and school children's interests. Unless we come up with some solutions to meet the needs by effectively coping with 
challenges in a timely manner, we would lose our leverage and seeing ourselves lagging behind the competition in the market. In this respect, there is a strong need for us to create an enabling environment in our organization to have our staff members productively indulge into an agility and nimbleness in the course of their work. Uh, to, put, to put it simply, as long as all those working in the organization do not hesitate in you know, accommodating new ways of working methods and transformative approaches to the issues assigned to them, we are able to perceive our organization as being innovative one. This will undoubtedly allow us to come up with something creative ideas for our works going beyond the thinking and approaches we've been holding onto. Fantastic. Um, Sarah, I might pose the same question. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> I pose the same question to you. Yeah, the question is, how do you know if your organization is being heaven? Okay, so that is a tough question, how do you know? Um, so in my organization, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, um, our main role actually is to connect and convene across a multi-stakeholder group. Um, so, you know, our, our main uh, challenge actually is to transform how we approach uh, the nexus between humanitarian and development action to reduce disaster risk and create resilient societies. And we're a small secretariat, somehow appointed to be a leader of a global system. We often say there are people doing disaster risk reduction and they don't even know it. We consider them part of the system. So. Um, the principles of agility, <coughs> openness, and partnership uh, are absolutely essential, but measuring them is absolutely uh, difficult. Um, so I think in, in our organization, we're looking increasingly also at how we are doing our work, asking ourselves as a first indicator, and we also practicing what we preach. And we're looking for uh, increased collaboration, uh, consultation, and of course, uh, the outcomes and eventual impact of our work to be measured. So uh, some of the ways we're trying to measure this is more in the impact evaluation and really building in, um, in all of our, whether it's a, a workshop through capacity development or a program that we're advising or in the tools uh, that we're giving to governments to help measure uh, policy progress, we're trying to look or what are those indicators of change, ultimate impact, and look through a theory of change. Um, so obviously it has to have all of those ingredients of the partnership, the collaboration, the enabling space, um, but it is difficult to measure. We try to do it through, through really looking through a theory of change lens and looking at the impact. Thank you. Um, I, I, I really liked the reflection on how our internal reflection is are we practicing what we preach? You know, very often in organizations that do innovation, um, our own internal processes sometimes are not even set up to become an agile organization. I mean, that's a really important um, element to consider. Um, Kerry, what do you think humanitarian innovators need to consider in order to be successful? Just a small question. Very small question. Um, well, uh, my organization, I'm uh, from the Kaushland Science Museum, which is part of the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. Uh, so we do not do uh, direct humanitarian work, but um, taking in everything that I've uh, read leading up to this conference and thinking about the tool, the game that uh, we have created, which will be participating in tomorrow. Um, I think a lot of what has already been set up here is really important. Um, you need this cross-sector collaboration, I think, is really important because a lot of times in any type of organization, even in our own organization, um, and especially in our own government, you see this siloed approach. And when one, one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing, there's, there's no way to move things forward. So I think cross-sector collaboration is really important. Um, and also uh, a fun and interactive approach we've really seen really uh, helps make that happen. Um, 
just as an example, we uh, a couple months ago played the extreme event game with a mix of participants that ranged from fifth grade elementary school students uh, to emergency responders and floodplain managers. And they were all able to participate in the same activity and collaborate together and get the same lessons out of it. Um, I'm going to jump ahead because I think that the point that you've raised is a really good one about collaborating with others. Um, and Mr. Hune, I might come back to you for that question. How do we actually collaborate with others? As a, from an IFRC perspective, you know, often working with what we call as non-traditional actors, it's, it's a tough thing for us. We don't really know how to break out of our mold sometimes um, and, and how to take a consortium approach to different, to different things. Um, so very key to hear, uh, Mr. Hune, from your perspective, how does your organization collaborate with others? Yeah, uh, from my personal point of view, I would like to stress out the three following uh, principles for the collaboration with other partners. Uh, first, alignment, impact, and agility. The first thing is alignment. As a technical is from private sector, all works related to our business should always be market focused. Thus, when collaborating with other stakeholders and partners, we think through the most market efficient way to generate the revenue in the course of our business. To attain this end, when maximizing the collaborative partnership with other partners, alignment with our organization's vision and strategic direction should not be put aside. And the second is impact. Innovations are dynamic processes which focus on the creation and imp implementation of new or improved, improved products and services, processes, positions and paradigms. Successful innovations are those that result in improvements in efficiency, effectiveness, quality or social outcomes and impacts. Furthermore, it is important that each organization should make a sustained attempt to stimulate the culture of innovation, which constructs the uh, connectedness and systemization on a number of good practice and good ideas. In doing so, the collaborative partnership will surely harness a range of expertise each organization is maintaining to uphold the impactful innovations. And the last is agility. Innovation in the private sector is often compared to evolution. Organizations, like organisms, survive and grow through variation, selecting new elements which help them to prosper in a particular environment. Innovative organizations are more likely to thrive. Despite the complexity and unpredictability of innovation, a successful innovation process heavily depends on agility. Once we are seek to adapt to new environments in the course of carrying out business, we are always striving to enter into partnership with the right partners in a timely manner. Great, thank you. Bill, <laughs> um, tell us what that means for APDRC. How, how does APDRC collaborate with others? How do you bring all of us here together for this amazing event? Sure, but uh, just one small correction by Aisha from the APTC, the Asian Business Africa Center. Sure, sorry. Uh, no worries. Uh, so the name actually, Peru, we're actually focusing in terms of how do you actually prepare for disaster. So our perspective, perspective is actually slightly different, maybe from the majority of you uh, present in this room. So in terms of what we think, in terms of how do we work very effectively, I think it was going back to Kerry's uh, notion on silo uh, effects in terms of not only in the governments, also in the uh, humanitarian sectors, also in the NGO sectors. A lot of people don't really know exactly the, what's going on out there in the world, in the landscape. So the first thing that we need to do is actually want to make sure that we can add value to the process. We want to make sure that we're actually addressing the needs and the priorities of the national governments, of the provincial governments, of the local communities. That's how we see in terms of the starting point of all collaboration, of all cooperation among agencies that needs to be started with. And also in terms of uh, having a very good understanding, uh, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. If you can utilize some of the existing resources, please do so. Uh, you don't need to start something fresh again if somebody already has done some of the work. And of course, the local knowledge and local context becomes another very important sort of aspect in the whole collaboration. We want to make sure that uh, we are fully utilizing existing resources at the local level uh, to ensure you have the maximum impact of that. So that's how we actually think about collaboration or cooperation uh, from the ADVC perspective. Thank you. Um, Fantastic. 
games. The next very small question I'll ask you. Um, what do you see the role of innovation in supporting local communities in disaster resilience? What are the opportunities there? Uh, I think it's, it's uh, very, very central. Uh, I just want to quickly mention that uh, years ago, after I had uh, served in the Peace Corps for two years as an English teacher here in Korea, I did my PhD at Stanford in a field which was very new at the time. This was in the late 1970s, communication research. And the founder of that field, Wilbur Schramm, is famous for saying that communication is the fundamental social process. Anyway, my turned out my doctoral advisor was uh, a man, Everett Rogers, who many of you may have heard of. He's spent his life studying innovations. And his book, The Diffusion of Innovations, went into a fifth edition. And he defined innovation as an idea, practice, or object that is perceived as new. He didn't say that's new, he said it's perceived as new by an individual or other unit of adoption. And so this afternoon I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about networks as innovation. And, but in answer to your question, the simple way of putting it was there's, there's no innovation without uh, communication, sharing of knowledge, uh, collaboration. Um, we in uh, my department, uh, I chair the Department of uh, Technology and Society now at uh, SUNY Korea. It's a Stony Brook University program. But we've introduced a new sequence in the ICT for sustainable development, which includes safety and disaster risk very much. But uh, the four pillars of that are digital networks, uh, first, secondly, uh, so-called big data, data science, data mining, data visualization. Third is the mobility, mobility revolution. And finally, uh, entrepreneurship and uh, startup ventures. So I think it's very, very, innovation is right at the heart of it. This is a very exciting uh, meeting as a result of that. Great. I might open this up to everybody, actually, because I think we've all, everyone will have some really interesting perspectives. Does anybody else want to add to that question? Um, well, I, let me uh, maybe bring up two ideas that might not uh, uh, always be at the forefront. And that, that is an, an initial idea very often is kept very close within an organization. Uh, with, within the commercial sector, there's often concerns around intellectual property. Um, there's a, in our sector, there tends to be a sense of uh, competitiveness. And I think collaboration, whether it's with local communities or amongst the, the different organizations within our community, uh, it's, it's, it's essential that innovation is open. Um, it's certainly past the initial ideas stage. And I think uh, certainly for Field Ready, we've put that at the center of, of what we do. Um, this is actually linked to the idea that Jim was just mentioning about the diffusion of innovation as well, because that's a, an essential part that's over, often overlooked. Um, it's often felt that if it's a great idea, of course, everyone will adopt this and pick it up. And that's certainly true for early adopters in the, diffusion, the theory of diffusion of innovation. What we need in this sector, though, is what the commercial sector gets fairly well, and that's this idea of marketing and sales. There needs to be this idea that a good idea needs to be pushed and it needs to be scaled up and scaled out across uh, not just a, a local you know, one-off type of thing, but something that might work in one place. If it's gonna be successful, that should be replicated, even if it needs to be tailored against the local context. But these two ideas, I think, are are often overlooked or fairly new to what we are working on within humanitarian innovation. Um, Bill, I might ask you um, about your perspectives on that as well, particularly with the lens that you spoke about earlier, working with local communities and enhancing what local communities are already doing. 
Um, what, what do you see as sort of the link between the work the community is doing and, and innovation? Uh, I think a lot of times local computers are already on the cutting front or cutting edge in terms of mm -hmm. things they're doing, but then the message is not being propagated upwards. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why uh, for us, working very closely with the local communities, with the provincial level governments, we understood in terms of uh, the constant participatory process to actually get many new ideas out there to properly test it to make sure that it's actually addressing the actual needs. Mm -hmm. And also for the thinking about the long-term sustainability of the ideas. Is it really practical? Is it really something that we can do after a project's finished, after funding is finished? Can the local governments, can the local community actually keep on running it afterwards? So that, that sort of becomes a starting point for us to consider any sort of innovations. Being more on the practical side. We want to make sure that uh, what we're doing is actually serving uh, their needs, not serving as, oh, it's a great new idea, so let's test it, but then what's next? I'm going to veer off the questions a little bit because that's um, really interesting what you've said. And, um, Sarah, we'd love to get your, your perspective on this. You know, very often with innovation, as, as you've talked about, you know, it's about it's not it's perceived as something new that we're trialing in a, in a particular space. Um, <coughs> and often these solutions are, tend to be external to the space that we're working in, the context of the community. How do we strike that balance between amplifying? what's already happening at the local level um, versus constantly flying in solutions that may go against the entire principles of innovation, but you know, we've got so many stakeholders that are so interested in this, but how do we strike that balance, I suppose? Um, and I know that within IFRC, it's something we battle on a daily basis. Um, so very keen to hear some perspectives on that. Okay. Yeah, I think striking a balance is uh, definitely a challenge with something that that we have to strive for if we embrace the principle of uh, consultation and all participation, a participatory approach. Um, I think, I mean, from, from my organization and from where I work, it's at a global level, yeah. right? So the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction responsible for trying to convene, coordinate, and provide guidance yeah. to implementation of a global policy framework, but at the same time reaching local yeah. level. And we know that the innovation of these global frameworks from 2015, um, SDGs, Paris Agreement, yeah. Urban Agenda, including Sendai, they all call for a participatory, bottom-up, people-centered approach. So how actually to do it? And again, you know, going back to practice what we preach, we have always to check our processes and see how they're working. So I think, um, the most important is to uh, understand, to have the local partners, whatever local is, I mean, you have to define what is local. I mean, sometimes local could be a sub-region, yeah. in, a, in a sense. Local could be a specific community. But one has to have partnership and collaboration from, from the start to identify what are, you know, it should be needs-driven, people-centered. So, so this is important. And how to strike that balance uh, I think it's, it's to ensure that we, we try and design processes, including the follow-up, constant follow-up, uh, and feedback loop to see how that impact is rolling out. So, for example, um, at, uh, at this global level in implementing the, the Sendai framework, uh, it calls for targeted uh, implementation guidance that's so very practical. And so, of course, the first thing we do is to launch a global consultation and call for persons to participate. But then you can go to a next level, right? Ask those persons who else should participate. And you can kind of have networks shooting down um, so, so that there should be uh, people and processes contributing that even they don't, maybe don't know what they're contributing in a sense, you know? So there's a global process to go uh, towards developing consultative guidance, but it should develop a kind of community of practice approach. Those communities should reach out to other communities and work through the network. So, I mean, that might be one approach. Does anybody else want to enter that question as well? Well, just, just to say that uh, innovations, uh, at be something, be conce conceived of as something that's perceived as new, uh, can spread at different rates you know, around the world. And I think there's always going to be a certain tension between uh, the global uh, and the local. Uh, for example, uh, you know, here in Korea, social networking 
was widely popular five years before Facebook was uh, even invented in the form of SciWorld. Now everybody in, the, in their 20s was a member of SciWorld here. But, um, but the, the SciWorld model, despite a couple of attempts, was never exported uh, back to the United States because of the importance of local cultural preferences and language. So if you look at a continent like Africa with, I think, thousands of uh, different languages, um, the local elements are always there. But um, in innovations, I mean, there are many, many uh, types of innovations. And these days, innovation is really a kind of, has become a, a buzzword along with, uh, I, I think, with the rise of uh, digital technologies, digital networks and other technologies that um, in the, the words of the title of Thomas Friedman's book, it's flattened the world, the world is flat. Uh, these networks, these new networks make it possible technically for literally anyone to talk to anyone else uh, on the planet Earth. But there's still the, the global, local attention in there. Okay, um, thanks for that. Um, you know, often when we talk about innovation, as, as people have said uh, today, there's so many elements of innovation that we can talk about, right? So specific to humanitarian innovation, what does this process, what do you think this process should look like for humanitarian actors? Um, James, I'm going to come back to you for that, if that's okay. Um, and then I'll open it up to um, other panelists as well. Well, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I, I actually, when I was much younger, way back in 1980, uh, for a brief time, I worked as a consultant to a committee at the National Academy of Sciences. It was the Committee on Disasters and the Mass Media. That's because my professor, Ev Rogers, was uh, chairing that committee, and it was a consulting opportunity. The way things were, were talked about back in the 20th century, uh, that era of the mass media, one-way powerful broadcasting, one-way communication, it's gone forever now. Uh, these digital networking, storage, computing, and communications technologies have uh, changed the whole media uh, ecosystem, uh, the media environment in which we uh, live and work. So the one thing uh, I would say is that I think that uh, humanitarian organizations and all stakeholders uh, working in the area of uh, disaster risk reduction or disaster resilience as this new center that we're very proud to host at uh, SUNY Korea uh, puts it. I, I think all organizations are faced with the challenge of how to leverage uh, the power of these new technologies because the, the existence of the networks and the technology is, is one thing. The actual utilization of them, the full exploitation uh, in uh, any of the uh, parts of the disaster management cycle. Uh, it, it's a challenge. Uh, just for, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, I finally, uh, I noticed that Google was offering a course called Power Searching with Google. I thought I was a power searcher <laughs> before I took the course and I realized the Google search engine is just such a simple web page but most users just scratch the surface of what it can do so uh, I recommend that course there's now a second one an advanced course and Google of course has become a verb it's entered into the uh, <coughs> English language because it's the leading or the, one of the easiest ways to actually uh, search the internet. But that comes back to this question of how do you balance uh, global versus local because 
here in Korea, there's a web portal called Naver, which is still overwhelmingly preferred by Korean people, even though Naver is not an internet search engine. It, do, it searches only Korean language material, and it's more of a collective intelligence uh, vehicle for Koreans. So I'd say the challenge is using how to use these new social networks, uh, Internet of Things is converging now, um, virtual reality, augmented reality, all these are really tools for human communication and that includes uh, the subject of the you're all concerned with here and that we're here to discuss. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Eric? Um, sure, it's a great question. I was thinking of all the different ways to answer it. So, um, in a sense, I, I'd like to keep a focus on the, on the local. I think we have very good tools in the field of development, uh, especially in participatory development, things uh, that have come out of PRA and others. There's a huge overlap between that and design thinking, which is the, the sort of main methodology in, in things like lean startup that come out of the commercial field. Those give us the tools on, on how to reach out and how to get good ideas. What we need, I think, is in a sense the leadership that allows those good ideas to come from very local people. Um, because when you look at the Sendai framework and some of these things we, we talk about, it, it's often talking about the system and the, the organization and so on, which is very important. But what's often left out of there is how much a disaster is catastrophic for individuals and families and then communities. If we keep that focus on how to solve their particular problem, I think we start to get very different results. Um, and so, it, you know, I'm reflecting on one experience we had um, actually in Nepal where we developed something locally. Um, and I, I think the, 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 our partners on the ground were very open to that solution that we came up with. Um, I believe the leadership of our larger partner was also behind it. Um, but what happened was that that gray area in between, that large mass of bureaucracy and where the functionaries sit um, weren't open to new ideas. And they have their procurement procedures and, you know, by gosh, we do things uh, international procurement and that's the way we do it and we can't reverse that and do local procurement. We can't, we can't handle local manufacturing in our procurement process. That's a real issue. Um, and that's a real blockage onto what could be great innovation. Yeah. And so I think that's where some of the problems are. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, I wanted to talk about, you know, in, in, in development and humanitarian uh, work, our, we have a very strong focus on doing no harm. So the question for me then, reflecting on this, is how do we move forward in this incredibly agile new way of working, embracing innovation principles while still maintaining a do no harm approach. I might open that up to Mr. Kim uh, for your perspective. <laughs> 인도주의 그 혁신의 접근 방법에 있어서 이러한 신기술 및 새로운 접근 방식이 지역사회 구성원들이 처한 어려움을 해결하는 것이 아닌 부담감으로 다가온다면 인도주의 혁신의 궁극적인 목적에 유배가 되는 행위일 것입니다. 그 예를 들어 아무리 뛰어난 기술이 수반되는 혁신이라도 그 지역사회 등이 사용할 수 없는 고비용과 복잡한 것이라면 진정한 인도주의 혁신이 아닐 것이며 보편적이며 모든 사람이 접근 및 사용 가능한 인도주의 혁신이 아닌 특정 계층 및 사람들에게 국한된 인도주의 혁신 또는 혁신은 지향되어야 할 것입니다. 따라서 이를 해결하기 위해서는 인도주의 혁신은 그 인간 중심 지역이어야 합니다. 인도주의 혁신을 추진하기 위해서 수혜자가 포함된 여러 이해 관계자들 간의 협력을 통해 혁신이 궁극적으로 지향하는 
목적지향성의 혁신이 이루어져야 할 것입니다. Carrie, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'll be addressing this a little bit more in my presentation tomorrow morning uh, before we do the Extreme Ed game. Um, but when we created the game, we did take input from the different stakeholders that we thought would be the end users of the tool. Um, and we also created the game so that it is uh, simple and agile and scalable. So it really puts the power in the hands of whoever is using it. Um, and it doesn't, in most cases, create any major barriers to its use. Um, and we also help to uh, provide, if, if someone comes to us and say we want to play this game, but maybe uh, we have limited funding and we can't produce the materials ourselves, we do loan materials to different users um, so they can use it. And then uh, coming here, this is the first instance where we are uh, working with um, an outside organization, an international organization, to um, assist them in adapting and translating uh, the materials for use in their own community. So it, it's a tool that has a, a set of um, learning outcomes, but it is really flexible in its use. So it's, um, we've seen that it can be used amongst uh, all different types of groups. Brilliant. So it's about how do we bring in our end users at the start of that process, reducing the cost barriers um, to end users, etc. Um, Mr. Kuhn, may I ask for your perspectives on the question as well? Innovations we're talking about is for the humanitarian innovation. What ma matters the most is not technology, but uh, how can you use it? In other words, as new applications of new technology become more prevalent amongst uh, humanitarians, the risks, limitations, and failures of technology also become more apparent. As such, there is a clear expectation that some of the key challenges result from unequal access to technologies among both affected population and humanitarians. Once and for all, there is no such a thing as follows. If one size fits all approach to humanitarian innovations for those concerned is available, where the humanitarian innovation can be flexible and doable in bringing together uh, all those related to humanitarian innovation in order for them to be on the same wavelength to definition of the humanitarian actions. Flexible is important. Bill, I might come back to you for your Sure, I think just uh, a personal observation. When we actually talk about innovation, uh, the focus has always been on tools and technologies. We really hardly talk about the other P's, process, positions, and paradigms. I think that's sort of the starting point where you focus on technology, you focus on the tools, that get confused in the whole process because innovation can happen in so many other ways. Uh, maybe I blame the private sector, I'm sorry. <laughs> because what we're actually driven, driven, when we're talking about innovation, we talk about technology, we think about you know, uh, the you know, Silicon Valley's and Apple, Apple's and Google's, <coughs> and that, but there's actually a lot more low level or uh, less high level innovations happening on the ground that we really talked about. So I think that's something that we, we already, we should be looking at. And also in terms of um, do no harms, so I mean, coming from a different perspective, because I'm, we don't do a lot of emergency response, we focus on disaster preparedness. Uh, a lot of things that you do during emergencies, uh, you need the data, you need the information before it even happens. So that usually is lacking at the moment. So I think in order to have a proper uh, marriage of innovations and uh, sort of emergency response, you need to focus on your emergency preparedness. You need to have those data, for example, the sex, uh, age, and uh, disabled, disaggregated data. You have those on hand, then you can be better to plan your emergency response after even strikes. So, so I think that the, the, the folks seem to shift a bit more towards on the preparedness side, of course being a little bit selfish here as well. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's something that we need to really look at and address as well. Brilliant, thank you. And I couldn't agree more often, we talk about the product, right, or the new, or the new tech coming in. And you know, for um, any development or humanitarian organization, um, not thinking about our own internal culture, 
our own internal processes, our capacity for change, our appetite to, to be agile. Leadership, I think, has been mentioned quite a few times today, too. Uh, how do we create that safe space to trial new things? Um, and we often use these words, safe space, fail, fail fast, fail quick, but is that really true, and do we actually have that space for experimentation?